Hey, what's up, House Church? Man, I'm so glad to be able to hang out with you tonight uh, and, and really to talk about what's one of my favorite books, my favorite passages in Scripture out of the book of James. And so before we get there, we're, we'll be in James chapter 4. We're talking about the promises of God, right? So last week, we, we talked about the promise of God's provision, that no matter what we have, and if we have God, we've got all we need, right? So this week, we're going to talk about the promise of God's presence, that no matter what's going on, no matter how, and this is a big thing for us, no matter how messed up we might think we are, or honestly, how much we have really messed up, God's presence is still real. Like, I don't know about you, but one of the things I struggle with is is in my flaws and my failures, when I know I've messed up, one of the hardest things for me to do is to actually go to God with that, right? Like I want to go away from him. I want to run from that mistake. I want to run from that problem. And I think, man, God doesn't, God doesn't want to hear this. God doesn't want to see this as if God doesn't already know, right? But what Scripture promises us, what James promises us, and we'll read this in just a second, is that in our flaws, in our failures, that God doesn't run from that. No, God runs to it and to us with healing and with restoration. And so here's what James chapter 4 says. We're going to read um, James chapter 4 verses 1 through 10, and then you'll have some time within the house church to kind of pick some of this apart and talk about what you're hearing and what you're seeing in this. So here's what it says. Verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. So the reason there's fighting that's going on around you is because there's a war within you, um, a war over passion, a war over desire. He says, uh, verse two, your desi- you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is in enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Man, that verse, that verse terrifies me. I hear people say all the time, like, man, only God can judge me. Like, that should scare you, right? This verse, it should scare you that there's a place that we can be in, in a, a posture that we can be in life that makes us an enemy with God. Verse 6, and here's where we get into some of the promises I want you to see tonight. But he, but God, gives more grace. He has more grace than you have sinned. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And all of that sounds awful, but here's how James wraps it up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he, God, will exalt you. He will lift you up. The idea of exalting is the idea of restoring dignity. So in our mourning, in our weeping, in our cleansing, that God restores our dignity. And so there's, there's three promises I want you to see here, okay, kind of throughout these, these verses. One, in verse 6, he says that, that God gives grace to the humble. The idea of grace is, is unmerited, it's undeserved favor, that even though I don't deserve it, even though I can never earn it, God loves me. God sees me. He sees you as a child of his, right? God gives grace to the humble. Verse 8, second promise, he says that if we draw near to God, that God will draw near to us. And remember, James is talking talking about this within the context of our passions and desires that draw us away from God. And so he says, even in our flaws, even in our failures, even in our mistakes, when we press into God, when we draw near to God, he doesn't run away from us. He runs to us. He, he is present. He is near us. And then verse 10, the last promise, that if we humble ourselves, that God will exalt you. So God, the promises, God gives grace to the humble, God gives his presence to the humble, and God exalts or he gives dignity to the humble. And so all of those promises revolve around the idea of humility, right? And so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways we could talk about humility. I've heard people say that humility, and I've said this a whole lot, humility is not thinking of yourself 
or thinking of your, thinking about yourself. It's not thinking of yourself less. It's thinking about yourself less. Wow, that was really hard. And maybe that's why I don't say that a whole lot. Um, it's thinking about yourself less, thinking of people more, right? But I, I think within this context, a really good way to look at the idea of humility is um, the freedom from pride. That's what the dictionary says, that humility is freedom from pride, which I love, man. I think it's such a powerful idea because pride, right, it kind of paints the picture that pride can be a prison, and it can. Like, pride traps us in a self-destructive cycle. It says, man, I don't need help. I don't need you. I don't need that. I don't need the church. I don't need community. No, I've got this. Where it says, I deserve this or you should this for me. And that pride, man, that pride keeps us from experiencing all those promises of God. His grace, his, his presence, his dignity. Pride keeps us from that. And so humility, humility is a step away from that pride. And so through these verses we read on verses uh, 7 through 9 in particular, we kind of see, I, I think, five commands, five directives that give us a picture of what a humble heart, a heart of humility looks like. So if we're going to experience that grace and that presence and the, the dignity of God that requires humility, then what does that look like for us? Well, I think there's five things. One, he says to submit to God, to, to pursue God's purpose over our pleasures. He says to resist the enemy, to set up those guardrails in our lives that, that protect us from the, the attacks, from the temptations, from the desires of the enemy. He says to draw near to God. And so in the same way, we set those habits in place that point us constantly to God, right? Scripture, uh, prayer, church, house church, like those kinds of things that keep us in the presence in the community of God. And then he says to cleanse your hands and to mourn and weep. That's, a, that's the last two, to cleanse your hands and mourn and weep. That's the idea of repentance, right? To a brokenhearted change. That's how I define repentance a lot, a brokenhearted change. So to cleanse your hands, to, to change, to make a change, but to mourn and weep, to do that in a brokenhearted way, to say, God, you know what? I, I've tried and I've failed and God, I need you. And, and pride keeps us from being able to admit that, right? That that, man, I've tried to find satisfaction. I've tried to find fulfillment. I've tried to find life apart from God, and I can't. And so when we're able to bring ourselves to that place, we submit to God, resist the enemy, draw near to God. When we cleanse our hands, when we mourn in, in repentance, well, it's there. And it's there that we find humility, which means we experience the grace and the presence and the dignity of God. And so, man, I think a great conversation for you tonight might be to look at those five things and, and talk about where's the one you struggle with. What do you struggle with the most? How can you begin to set some of those guardrails? How can you begin to set some of those habits? And understand, like, the whole point of this space is that you don't do this alone, that you have people around you that can help you, that can point you, that can, can walk alongside of you in this journey because, man, we're all meant to do this together, right? So look, I, I love you, man. I, I'm so thankful for you. I can't wait to hear the conversations that come out of your house church tonight. We'll see you Sunday.